we stand together on the word of God and get directly into the subject of theology and ethics. We will again define them, see them separately, see them together and realize what the word of God is teaching clearly. Let us jump directly to Romans 7 and verse 8. Romans 7 and verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. This is the point right now. This last part of the verse, underline it and focus on it. For without the law, sin was dead. Father, we thank you for divine revelation to you, divine word. We receive it and we thank you for teaching us all things that pertain to you and to our lives in accordance to your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Without the law, Sin was dead. Now, it doesn't say that sin is not sin. It doesn't say that evil is no evil. But it says to define evil and to define sin, you have to have a definer, somebody who does the definition. And it's not relevant at all. It is an absolute value. It is something that God gives the definition. And since God is our Lord in our life, then his word is our final authority. I'm saying this again. Don't be confused. By the wording that says, without the law, sin was dead. It does not mean sin would cease to be sin. It will be the same situation. Evil. Evilness, sin. But who can tell if somebody is not the moral giver? And I will explain. Read it once more. For without the law... What's the law? The law is the word. The law of God is the word of God. Amen? The law of God is the word of God. Without the law, sin was dead. Go in the same book of Romans to chapter 4. Verse 15. Because the law worketh wrath. The law worketh wrath. Why? For where no law is, there is no transgression. In other words, wrath is put within context to show us that wrath is righteous. It is purposeful and I'm uh, reminded by the one who reminds the scriptures the Holy Spirit I attribute the glory to him I think and I believe it's James 120 and I'm open to correction if it's otherwise please let me know but James 120 says that the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of of God. The wrath of man does not work does not work the righteousness of God. But the wrath of God works the righteousness of God. You see the balance now? For where the law no law is, there is no transgression. Again, it doesn't mean transgression is not transgression, but somebody has to define it. 
Lawyers don't go by what they think, but they go by the laws they can find written in the Constitution. And then one more verse, go back one chapter, 320. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Now you see, yes, there is a law. Yes, there is the wrath of God for those who transgress the law. But nobody is justified by the law. Why? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law does not serve as um, a means for, for salvation. But it serves as a means of recognizing your sin. You see how clear the word of God is? The law is holy. The law is good. Paul is saying to Timothy. But the law is not there to save you. The law is there to show you that you're out of order. I'm out of order. We have transgressed the word of God. And by the law, no man will be justified. Before we go on, immediately God cuts us at this point. He says, don't you dare think that because you know the law, you're justified because you know you have sinned. So recognition of sin is number one. Repentance from sin by believing in the forgiveness in the blood of Jesus is what gets us saved. And we are saved by grace and grace alone. Not by the law that shows us the sin, but by the finished work of God through grace and by faith in the work of Christ. You see how balanced this is? Amen. Therefore, by the deeds, 320, Romans 320, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay. Again, this does not say where there is no law, there is no sin. This is saying that somebody who is absolutely moral has to define and tell us what sin is and what is not. That's why his words, number one purpose in teaching us, Ezekiel 4.23 in the Old Testament, Hebrews 5.24 in the New Testament, is that we all be able to separate and distinguish between good and evil, holy and profane, by absolutely dividing the word of God, the word of truth, uh, as students of the Bible, knowing that God is the absolute moral giver. In other words, the law comes from God. Again, in other words, the law of God is above the law of the land. In other words, God's divine judgment and his court is higher than the Supreme Court of the United States or the Supreme Court of our land. God's law is above every other law. And it is the case with Peter that says, Judge ye, O men, that are hearing us right now, whom we will hear. You that say not to believe or say anything again in that name, the name of Jesus, but we cannot say but that which we believe in the name of Jesus. 
We are not here to bring a revolt, a revolution to the land. We are not rebellious. We are not bringing revolution and rebellion. But we are bringing the law of God. Not by force. Not by might. But by the spirit of God. It's funny because uh, in the latest years in Russia, they outlawed Salvation Army. How many of you know what's Salvation Army? Salvation Army started very well with William Booth uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. And um, it spread all over the world. It was spirit-filled, powerful, and, on, and so on and so forth. But uh, it uh, inclined to be like all other denominations. And um, uh, it's working basically as a charity more than a church but anyway because they are called salvation army they outlawed it because they said it's an army therefore it's dangerous and it may bring a revolution or a coup d'etat but you see we christians are not trying to fight our fight in the flesh for our warfare is not physical, but it's spiritual. spiritual. And the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. For we cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth again, itself against the word of God. And we are ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience becomes full, to the full extent. So... We make it clear that Christians are peaceful people, but are people that are not bowing down to any system, any law that lifts up itself above the law of God. And we declare this is the most moral book. This is our constitution above every other constitution. Yes, we are lawful and we strive to be lawful citizens in the country where we live but we will always have the word of god as the book as the constitution as the moral law given by the absolute being by the higher power by the highest power by namely jehovah elion the lord the most high god none above him none beyond him amen we show respect to our human fellow man, but at the same time we let them know nobody can stop us, praise the Lord, from speaking the word of God. That's why God made man and a woman. A helper. Amen? Thank you. That's what I exactly needed. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're talking about theology and ethics. You see, theology, as we said, without ethics is knowing theology, knowing about God. But theology with ethics is knowing God. And more than that, not only knowing God, but Living like God, acting like God, meaning according to his character, according to his goodness, according to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not being gods as the Mormons believe. Amen. God will always be the only one God. Amen. We will always be his sons and daughters. He's our God. But we will live a godly life. Remember that word? Godly life. And godly life only comes with ethics. So a society with just theology will do you no good. A university that teaches, and I had this sad experience, to my shogas and baby believer a newborn christian i didn't know much i was so excited to take courses in the university and i thought my professors would be 
born again believers because there were New Testament theologians, Old Testament theologians, Hebrew experts and all of this. And I thought they know God and I spoke to them as if they knew God and I found out to my disappointment they had no idea, no personal relationship with God but they knew a lot about God. In the apps, in the abstract sense in the theological spectrum but no relationship whatsoever so a society with theology and ethics is a society that will bring theology into your life so that you will act like God, being like, like a child of God. You will be a godly person, not a God person, but a godly person. You will be a conscious person, having consciousness that is not ironed, as it says, about the world outside there. They have ironed conscience. They're, it's cauterized, cafeterias many. It's like they don't feel anything because their conscience is ironed. And get uh, cauterized, and, and they don't feel nothing. That's why it has to be, it has to be uh, renewed. It has to be quickened by the Spirit. Uh, as it says in um, Ephesians 2, from verse 1, uh, he, he, he found us in our sins and trespasses, and he loved us, and he gave us a new life, and our conscience became sensitive to the word of God, to the moral law of God. Amen? That's why he said, I will take away a stony heart, and I will put in you a, a, a heart of flesh, a sensitive heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're so glad to have our precious ones from abroad again. Amen. Praise the Lord. I named my previous um, sermon on theology and ethics. Ethics is applied theology. Again, ethics is applied theology. Theology. What is ethics? Applied theology. In other words, by saying theology and ethics, we refuse all kinds of other ethics that are trying to replace God's ethics and God's moral law. People say, well, by the time you don't bother anybody, you're a good person. It's good enough for me. It's good enough for our society. How many of you know that I may not bother you, but I may bother you? And how many of you know that we are all guilty? We are all guilty of being a hindrance at least to one person around us per day. Or per hour. <laughs> Every day of our lives. Amen. Because sin lives in us according to. Uh, in our members. Because we live in the flesh. We live in the, with, within these five senses. And let us go back to uh, Romans 7. From, from where we left off. I just showed you. Listen to this. I want you to remember these three verses. That establish ethics and theology. Especially ethics. Romans 8. Romans 7, 8. Romans 4, 15. And Romans 3, 20. These three verses. They are interwoven. Interconnected. You got it? Amen. For without the law, sin was dead. Because the law worketh wrath. For there were, were no law is, there is no transgression. And, and also, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. 
For by the law is the knowledge of sin. These three verses, again, Romans 7, 8, Romans 4, 15, Romans 3, 20. Praise God for Christian education. Now, last verse we read, meaning 3, 20, it says, knowledge of sin is only by the law. This law, not any other law. We say, yes, but he's a good person. He's a good family provider. Doesn't matter. Still, we live in the flesh. Still, we get, we are caught up into things that are uh, carrying us away. And we need to repent. Repentance is a lifestyle. And I found the answer to all those that say, well, if I've been a good person to everybody, I said, how about to the Lord Jesus? Have you been good to him? I said many times, and I'm saying to everybody who challenges me with that, I said, what have you done with the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus? How good have you been to what the Lord Jesus has done to you in such a goodness? Is there any more goodness is there any greater love than for a person to lay down his life for his friend? That's what the Lord Jesus has done. What have you done with the Lord Jesus? Do you love him? Oh, yes. But the Bible says if you love him, you do his commandments. You do his commandments? Oh, yes. Well, tell, tell me one of his commandments. They will probably not know even one of the, of the commandments of God. And if they say they do, ask them. What are the commandments in the word? Do you read the word? I read it when I was in high school. That doesn't count. Because he says, if you love me, study this word day and night. You know, they made statistics they went out and asked people, tell me two of the commandments of God. Mm, many, remember thou shalt not kill, murder, that's it. And then they told them, give me six brands of beer. And they found four or five of them, most of them. But they couldn't find two commandments out of the ten. That's our society. And those who found the five or four or even six out of the brands of beer called themselves Christians. Yet they couldn't found, they couldn't find the commandments of God. You see, theology without ethics, not even theology, because theology, at least you know about God. And these people don't even know about God. And I want you to know that people are ignorant of God. And we are supposed to bring them God. Amen. But I'm trying to see and show you how ethics is only attached to theology. Christian theology. And to the word of God only because we refuse the Hindu theology, the Islamic theology, the Buddhist theology. All kinds of theologies and ethics. We refuse all of these kinds of of ethics because other ethics go against the word of God and whatever goes against the word of God which is absolute and is the absolute moral law and the Lord is the absolute moral law giver then they have no God so we want, we want the real theology with real ethics together go on with me seven Romans 7, 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. This shows us the innocency of little children. For example, little children, are they saved or not? Yes, they are. Why? Because they haven't died spiritually. To be born again, you have to die spiritually. And to die spiritually, you only die when the law comes to your life. When you, Romans 3.20, recognize sin through the law of God. 
Now it doesn't mean if somebody didn't study, didn't read the word of God, he's not aware of God's law. Because Romans 2, read it from verse 11 to 16, it tells us that the law of God is taught to every man through what is around us, through nature. I mean, he's uh, the, 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 the author of Romans, the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, who is the real author of the scriptures, said those that without the law do the things of the law, they have a law in their lives. What's that? That's the law of God. It means that man was made with a God-made, God-shaped vacuum so that we will need God in our lives. Nothing can replace God in us. You put anything else, yet there is an emptiness until God takes his place in this God-shaped vacuum. And this was said by a Christian philosopher. But praise the Lord. You see that little children under the age of accountability are not dead spiritually. They live supernaturally in the innocency of God. In the goodness of God. Amen. But once they realize in their conscience... I have sinned, not against daddy and mommy. How many of you know that, how many of you know Christo? You're the newest father and one of the oldest too. Starting, I mean, uh, your legacy years back. But you're the newest father. Has your Marcos Costandinos However good both names are, as you explained them to me, they are absolutely fantastic. They don't have anything to do with immorality, with sin. On the contrary, they love God. And according to his name, Marcos Costandinos, he is a moral person. Right? Has he sinned against you yet? From the time he was born, he sinned against his mother and against... He, he came out crying and demanding everything, thinking that he is the center of the universe. That's what happens with little, little children. I mean, who makes them? Who, anybody has to teach little children how to cry? None, right? They, of course are born in sinful nature, but their soul is totally, morally innocent. Marcos Costandinos Yana do Timitume. Aftos puden and the affair de Yada Bigel and the affair de Yada Burania. Costandinos in a stafferos. Amen, so be it in your child's life and in all of them in Jesus' name. Amen. And to all of us. But you see the difference between, uh, it's written in Ezekiel chapter 3, chapter 18, 22, and 33. You find in Ezekiel many times saying that children will not die for the sins of their fathers and the fathers not die for the sins of their children but each one each one will die for their own sin you see even though they carry the sinful nature and they do things you tell a child one year old two year old don't touch the uh, the plaque they will do exactly that the opposite of what you tell them who taught them that? You see? But their soul is so innocent. Then they give you a smile and you forget all about it. They're so innocent. They're it's so innocent that you cannot explain it other than coming directly from God. So we believe 
children under the age of accountability, even though they sin against others, their parents, they hit their brothers and sisters, hit them, do things to them, but they have not sinned to the Lord. That's the point somebody dies. When they come to the age of accountability and their heart strikes them, their conscience strikes them, then they die spiritually. And they need to be born again. That's the age of accountability. Amen. For I was alive without the low ones. But once, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I died spiritually. And the commandment which was ordained to life, verse 10, I found it to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Now, it's not the law that is not holy. The law is holy and good. But the law caught me in my act of sin, sin red-handed as they say. At the time I was doing it. And there starts a fight. There starts a fight. And it's a good thing because that's the life of the believer. I'm born again. I, I am God conscious, word conscious. I have morals. I have ethics because of my theology and theology and ethics together. I, don't, I, I do not only know about God. I know God. I have a relationship with him. And that's why my heart strikes me every time I grieve the Holy Spirit. Every time the law catches me. That's not referring to the old life. I'm going to take you directly to verse 22. Go there directly. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. We are talking about a born again believer that rejoices in studying and living the word of God. And because our time is up, I cannot continue. The whole chapter, which is a beautiful chapter that shows the fight between flesh and spirit. What's that? That's the ethics because of our theology. That's the ethical life we want to live. That which I want to do, I don't do. Lord, help me to do that which I want to do according to your word. And thank God for Romans 8, 1. There is, let's read it together and close with it. There is therefore now no condemnation, shall no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the choice is ours. Can we choose, even though we walk in this flesh, do we have war in this flesh? Of course. Sin lives in these members. Not in my body. In these senses. He tries to creep in. My body is holy. Learn to separate between flesh and body. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Nothing evil. Whatever teaches the body is evil is Gnosticism. Gnosticism, the early heresy. And still there is in Orthodox and Catholicism. That's what they've done. That's what they still teach today. But we teach the body is for the Lord. The Bible says that. And the Lord is for the body. And it says my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But it says at the same time we live in the flesh. Meaning we live and have consciousness through these senses around us we have temptations we have sin against us the devil creeping against us trying to lie against us so we have to fight the good fight and i can choose to walk in the spirit rather than walk in the flesh amen can we do that for the read verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus law what's that a law praise the lord that's the same law the same law that killed me because it made me recognize my sin the same law have quickened me i'm saying this again same law that killed me same law quickened me 
same law that killed me same law revived me resurrected me the law is innocent is good it showed me my sin it's my sin that killed me and my repentance and faith in the blood of Jesus and their righteousness and the nature and the birth new birth in Christ Jesus in the Holy Spirit gave me life back for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death read verse 8 from 8 8 so then they that are in their flesh cannot please God still as a born-again person I can choose either to please God or to please the flesh and this is the challenge you read at home Ephesians 5 10 everything we do in our lives we should strive consciously to please God amen God's word is so good so good so good father we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon us Lord to do exactly what you're teaching us in your moral law to do and we accept the challenge but we declare and confess a part of you we can do and are nothing but in Christ Jesus we can do all things in Christ and through Christ who strengthens us and everybody said Amen